Yes, thank you. And to you silence your mic while um, uh, I'm speaking. You, we can wait 30 seconds and you can start. So people is gonna be there. People is in, now entering to the, to the place. Uh -huh. Thank you, bye. Bye. Well, a pleasant good afternoon to all of you attending this webinar on the impact of COVID-19 on human rights in the Caribbean. My name is Paul Spencer, and I work at the Executive Secretariat of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. A warm welcome to everyone. Today, we have over 320 persons registered and in attendance via Zoom. We would like to thank all who have tuned in for the event on the public sector and the NGO community in particular. We have a very distinguished panel drawn from academia, CARICOM institutions, and civil society, which I will now introduce. Firstly is Ms. Margaret May McCauley, who is a commissioner uh, at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons of African Descent and Against Racial Discrimination at the commission. She's also one of Jamaica's leading jurists and a principal human rights advocate. Uh, Commissioner McCauley will be followed by Ms. Rhoda Reddock, who is a professor at the Center for Gender and Development Studies, University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus, Trinidad and Tobago. She's a leading advocate for women's rights and empowerment, and is currently a member of the UN committee the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Professor Radok is also now a member of the UN Committee. Uh, well, I've said that before, sorry. Uh, she'll be followed by Mr. Raj Malcolm, who is the Executive Director of Jamaicans for Justice, a nonprofit, nonpartisan, nonviolence, citizens' rights action organization advocating for state transparency, accountability, and overall good governance. Next will be Dr. Lisa Inda. She is an assistant director, surveillance, disease prevention and control, and control division at the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CAFA, located in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Inda is a public health scientist who specializes in, in infectious diseases, food safety, and tourism and health. Next, we have Ms. Elizabeth Riley, who is Acting Executive Director at the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, SIDEMA, based in Barbados. Ms. Riley has over 20 years experience in the area of disaster management at the regional and international levels in various capacities. Ms. Nadine Bushell is a projects and program coordinator at the CARICOM Implementing Agency for Crime and Security Impacts in Trinidad and Tobago. Ms. Bushell supervises work in the field of resource mobilization, project identification, formulation, and evaluation. And then finally, will be Professor Rosemary Bell Antoine who is Dean of the Faculty of Law and Professor of Labor Law and Offshore Financial Law at the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill Campus, Barbados. Professor Bell Antoine was also a former president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Lastly, I wanna extend my thanks to the team from the, Inter -American, the Executive Secretariat of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights led by the Acting Executive Secretary, Maria Claudia Polivio, in attendance here today. In keeping with this 2017-2021 work plan and strategy, the Commission is reaching out to the Caribbean in an effort to strengthen its relationship with countries of this region. Language and a lack of human and financial resources for bridging this gap have posed a challenge but the commission is charting a course to address this gap. Having input from the Caribbean in our events and programs is essential. 
especially on a matter such as the subject of this webinar that has had such a devastating impact on all aspects of the lives of people throughout the Americas. This virtual webinar provides an opportunity for us to listen, discuss, and reflect on various challenges to fundamental human rights resulting from the pandemic. It also provides a forum to review and analyze how Caribbean countries are advancing policies to protect human rights during this health emergency. Let me say a few words about the methodology we will adopt. Each panelist will speak for about eight minutes to discuss respectively issues on justice in the context of the pandemic, the impact of COVID on gender-based violence, fundamental freedoms, citizen security, health, and on handling the pandemic in a humane manner. During the presentations, the audience will be able to write questions in the Q&A box in the Zoom menu, and the executive secretary's team of specialists will be responding in real time. After the first round of presentation, presentations, I'll raise one or two of the most asked questions in the Q&A box, and each panelist will have three minutes for conducting remarks. We all look forward to your enlightening presentations and a lively discussion. For those joining from Latin America, interpret interpretation services are available. Please select your preferred language English or Spanish to follow the presentation. It is now my honor to give the floor to Commissioner Margaret May McCauley. Commissioner McCauley, you have the floor. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, uh, very warm welcome to, to all of you. Um, the panelists first, friends of old who are in the panel, and friends of new who are on the panel as well, and all those who are online. I am a truly warm welcome to you. And I thank the panelists for agreeing to participate in this, what we consider a very important event. I'm going to speak very quickly because this is a truncated um, presentation because of the short time assigned. I start with the main actions of the Commission regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. The Rapid Integrated Response Coordination Unit, known as SEQUOI by its Spanish acronym, was established on the 27th of March, 2020 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic to strengthen the institutional capacities of the Commission for the protection and defense of fundamental freedoms and human rights in the, in the region, especially the right to health and other economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. The COI is a planned strategy which focuses on the development of mechanisms to work protect preventively in situations that may affect the human rights of populations and groups in vulnerable situations in the region. The specialized operational group that represents this the crisis provides instruments to all areas for coordinating adequate responses from the Inter-American Commission for the protection of human rights. Sakoi reinforces integrally and intersectionally with, the, with an emphasis on the protection of human rights by the following. Gathering evidence on its impact, monitoring responses adopted by the states in the region, identifying urgent cases in a timely manner through our petitions and cases system and precautionary measures systems as well. Proposing to the Commission actions to be taken in member states to effectively protect and defend human rights during the pandemic. 
identifying opportunities, providing technical assistance to, for the development of policies and actions by states with a focus on human rights, following up on recommendations, carrying out dissemination and capacity building activities, depending in dialogue and articulation with specialized international organizations and civil society organizations. Some actions which uh, occurred um, after we established Sakai, major ones anyway. The first, the, pub the publishing of 30 press releases on the human rights situation and COVID-19 in several countries and on especially vulnerable groups in the region. The publication of at least 146 Sakai COVID-19 tweets are based on applying the criteria of gravity and ge geographical distribution. Hosting social forums with civil society organizations from 13 states. I will not list the states too much time, but go by. Hosting a series of webinars since the end of March 2020 on a wide range of subjects relevant to the pandemic and the rights of access to services. 243 precautionary measures relevant to COVID-19 were received. 225 were evaluated and two were granted. One on indigenous peoples in Brazil and on the other on migrants deprived of liberty in the United States. The third action plan of Sokoi 19 was approved recently to continue the line of work I've already mentioned and to draft a report on the situation of human rights in the context of the pandemic in America, in the Americas. Two major resolutions relevant to COVID-19 were approved by the commission. The first is a resolution number one, 2020. This was adopt, adopted on the 20, 10th of April, 2020, and is entitled, The Pandemic and Human Rights in the Americas. In response to, to the unprecedented global health emergency facing the Americas and the rest of the world and to ensure that, measure, that the measures adopted by the state for care and containment of the virus must be based on the full respect for human rights. It is a comprehensive approach of the commission to the pandemic based on standards of the inter-American human rights system and formulates a set of recommendations for states in the region to confront the uh, virus from a human rights approach. Moreover, the resolution stipulates that measures result in restrictions of rights and measures that result in, in, in restrictions of rights or guarantees must comply with the pro-persona principles of proportionality, temporality, and must strive for strict compliance with public health objectives and comprehensive protection. States must, when issuing emergency and containment measures against uh, the, uh, um, the pandemic, provide and apply intersectional perspectives and pay special attention to the needs and differentiated impact of such measures on the human rights of groups historically discriminated against and who are especially vulnerable. The next resolution, Resolution 4 of 2020, was adopted on the 27th of July, 2020. And it, um, this is entitled Human Rights of People with COVID-19. It establishes the Inter-American Guidelines on the Human Rights of Persons with COVID-19. It notes that efforts of states to contain the spread of the virus are affected by the pre-pandemic context in the continent. 
which includes discrimination, poverty, inequality, structural weakness of public health systems, and in many cases, the lack of political and institutional stability. These hamper the effectiveness of the confinement and social distancing measures. Now, a few words on lessons learned and the situation that the pandemic has worsened. Democracy and the rule of law are necessary conditions to attain validity and respect for human rights. And the legal acts of limiting these rights can have a direct impact on democratic systems, the fundamental role of independence, and the performance of public powers and control institutions, especially on the judicial and legislative powers in the context of a pandemic importance of cooperation is stressed by the Commission. It is important that states have the support, participation and cooperation of individuals and groups from civil society, such as non-governmental organizations and community-based organizations, and from the private sector, to ensure that preventive actions, containment and treatment of the pandemic are effective and timely. The Americas in our region, as we know that, are the highest, have the highest inequality in the world, characterized by deep social gaps in which poverty and extreme poverty constitute a cross-cutting problem for all states. This makes it difficult or impossible for millions of people basic preventive measures against the virus, particularly when it affects groups in situations of special vulnerability. This has been a problem for many years in our region. Poverty is the greatest risk factor for the contracting and so succumbing to diseases. And people living in poverty also have less medical attention once infected. There are some emergence of new issues which I mentioned. Inequalities are being magnified by social isolation. New issues have emerged, such as the right to breathe, the stigmatization of health sector workers, the problem of the digital divide in the right to education and labor rights during the pandemic. Commissioner, can you? Um... I, I, am, I am winding up. Okay, thank you. So, Problems which existed before the pandemic, such as gender-based violence, domestic violence, or the growing burden of non-communicable diseases in the region, are also being aggravated. Um, the most vulnerable groups continue to suffer from greater discrimination and inequality. These groups in include indigenous people, Afro-descendants, women, children, adolescents, people deprived of liberty, people with disabilities, migrants, LGBTI, the poor, the indigent population, and workers in the health sector, and the elderly, and those with disabilities. I thank you all for your kind attention, and I look forward eagerly to your presentations. And I should add, I'm also the Rapporteur for Women's Rights. Thank you very much, Commissioner Macaulay, uh, for very insightful presentation. Uh, I now pass the floor to uh, Ms. Rhoda Reddock for her um, intervention. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to everyone and I look forward to an important good discussion. Now the IACHR resolution number 4 2020 on human rights of persons with COVID-19 observed that although the populations of the countries of the Americas have been and continue to be extremely hard hit by the global pandemic, efforts to, in the Americas to halt the virus and the disease it inflicts have been impaired by regional circumstances predating the pandemic, such as discrimination, poverty, inequality, structurally weak public health systems, and in many cases, a lack of political and institutional stability. Uh, now, the question we may ask is how did it get this, day, this way? 
Now, many of these are the result of deep-seated structural problems with colonial legacies. But some of them are the result of the more recent results of the core strategies on global economic restructuring following the Washington Consensus, which have wreaked havoc on the economies of many in this region. Indeed, many of these policies were introduced first in the Americas through structural adjustment policies in the 1970s. But since then, the ideologies surrounding this have become much more widespread. And indeed, most of our governments have instituted policies in this regard. Uh, among the responses of the government of Trinidad and Tobago to the COVID pandemic was the establishment of a post-COVID recovery committee. And in response to a call for, for submissions, CAFRA TNT, the local membership of the Caribbean Association for Feminist Research and Action, made a submission which observed, for one, that the national vulnerabilities were exposed by this pandemic and some of these were the issue of food security and the recognition that the many countries in the region are reliant on food imports. And at last count in my own country, there's an annual food import bill of over $500 million, often traded in foreign exchange. In addition, the pandemic exposed the global dependence on one or two countries for manufactured products, including medication and medical supplies, including virtually all of the PPE in the world. Now, this constitutes a global problem with serious local implications. And many of our countries have also had their manufacturing industries destroyed, resulting in even more dependence on global supply chains. In addition, we've noted the concentration of global production in a few low wage countries, many based on exploitative female labor, with the result that almost the entire Caribbean region now depends on tourism for its survival. Now with this new paradigm, responsibilities for social support were also shifted to non-governmental organizations to a large degree, many of whom struggle in a constant search for funds and for job security for their employees. In addition, the increase in insecurity employment contracts and the individualization of working arrangements had meant that many, including women and children and mothers, especially the self-employed, euphemistically referred to in recent times as entrepreneurs, who now were found to have no access to sick leave, no vacation benefits no pension benefits, and otherwise no social protection, and were virtually on their own. The absence of, the st of structured social services to identify the vulnerable is also an issue, as it was difficult to identify those who needed specific socioeconomic and social psychological needs before it is too late. The last three decades also brought us to extreme levels of inequality and precarity, but also a period of ideological conservatism and patriarchal backlash after a period that opened up new and intersectional forms of equality. This is evident in religious fundamentalism, resurgence of racism, state sometimes state supported movements against sexual and reproductive rights, ethnic conflict, shades of fascism, and anti-gender movements, and in many instances, a retreat from the gains of the women's movement in the decades of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. The ISCHR resolution number 4, 2020, observed that this region is also characterized by high rates of generalized violence, and particularly violence based on gender, race, and ethnicity, and this violence in the region must be understood in the context of the continued structural violence characteristic of the region historically, but also exacerbated more recently 
by the police and military responses to the fallout of these economic policies. In addition to the situations where gang welfare has become a main mechanism through which the poor in many parts of our region survive. This violence is intersectional in that forms of hegemonic and subordinate masculinities interface with class, economic status, race, and ethnicity to create the context for the structural violence and organized crime that characterizes the region. And in response to the widespread criminal violence, we have a social climate where populations are willing to give up certain rights in the interest of security in inverted commas. So heightened securitization then becomes a P mechanism to address the fallout of this economic paradigm. Now COVID-19 presented a number of opportunities. I'm going to list some of them in case I don't have the time to complete. One in that it brought out gender-based violence. It opened up the possibilities for additional attention. Second, the COVID pandemic raised this factor of COVID in prisons. And certainly in my country, there was an attempt at the start to fast track the release of hundreds of persons on the remand for long periods, sometimes up to 10 to 12 years. This, however, was only partially successful. Third, the migrant and refugee crisis in Trinidad and Tobago came to a head due to the ex xenophobia exacerbated by our economic situation. Trinidad and Tobago, my society is a quintessential migrant society. Few of its residents can claim residence there beyond two to three generations. Additionally, Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela have historically had extremely close relations, people to people relations, seven miles from Trinidad at its closest point. The indigenous peoples of Trinidad and Venezuela moved backward and forward and the Rawao people from that section of Venezuela actually held San Fernando Hill, the hill in our second town, a sacred spot and made annual pilgrimages to this site. Many of the early cocoa farmers were Venezuelan peasants who settled in the cocoa estates of the Northern Range and Central Valleys. But this current and many Trinbegodians have relatives in Venezuela and vice versa. And there are generations of Trinidad and Tobago descendants in Venezuela. So this current crisis where the interests of migrant or refugee Venezuelans are pitted against those of locals in a financial crisis has created a terrible xenophobia which has influenced state policy in our culture of electoral politics. Now, during the COVID period, citizens and journalists' questions at media briefings called for greater state action to keep out Venezuelans, who were blamed as being vectors of the COVID-19 disease. And in response, the population was asked to help the police by identifying illegal immigrants. So while the government in 2019 agreed to register all Venezuelan migrants present in the country at that time, and 16,000 were registered. They had no access to education, to national insurance, or to normal health services. And although allowed access to COVID-related care and testing, the fear of repatriation, especially by unregistered persons, prevents this. Venezuelans in Trinidad and Tobago are not recognized as refugees, and the internationally accepted humanitarian principles of non refoulement are not recognized. In response to the recent- Professor, Can you um, uh, wrap up a little bit? Uh, okay, I understand. So what I point I want to make is that how so many civil society organizations recently wrote to the prime minister requesting a change in the state's policy. Now I conclude by asking for a human rights culture for the region, because while our governments have signed on to many regional and un international conventions, Little is known about them among the CARICOM public, and except primarily for the death penalty, which many lawyers approach, with which many lawyers approach human rights bodies. And I ask for human rights education, not only in relation to how individuals or group 
courts could approach the state or to strengthen our culture of litigation, but to address the ways in which our diverse society members understand and treat each other. I argue that a gender informed intersectional human rights education can help young people and even children to accept the humanity and equality of all, recognizing the dignity inherent in each person. And this would then generate support for social and psychological interventions, address behavioral and mental health problems, addictions, and the trauma, which can prevent much of the antisocial behaviors. And this could also help develop a greater sense of social justice and a recognition of the need to treat everyone fairly and for everyone to have the best chance to develop to their fullest potential. Unfortunately, our systems are not organized in a way to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Redaka, for a very informative and thought-provoking um, presentation. Uh, our next speaker is, has arrived, um, Dr. Uh, um, Mr. Roger Malcolm, um, uh, thank you for coming. But before I give the floor to you, I just want to let the audience know that you can put your questions in the Q&A box, um, which is in the Zoom platform. And that for those joining from Latin America, uh, interpretation is in, available into Spanish and vice versa, Spanish to English. So without further ado, may I give the floor to Mr. Malcolm? Thank you. Thank you very much for the time. Uh, I wish I had the benefit of hearing the people who spoke before me, uh, but I, I trust they were great. Sorry for my, my tardiness. And so I, I have a few ideas to share. We don't have that much time uh, that are informed by my experience as a practitioner um, and just some trends in the region. Now, I think in general, COVID presents a very unique um, set of situations for governments and for societies at large, um, it really is a test of not just democratic institutions, um, but the principles, human rights principles of in interrelatedness, indivisibility, um, and interdependence, um, which generally understand that the safeguarding and progression of one right is oftentimes never at the expense, within limitations, of course, of other rights. And so we're faced now with, with a fundamental threat to the right to health and several other things, and uh, a diversity of responses um, to that, that either seek to limit particular rights within parameters allowed for under domestic and international law, um, as well as approaches that call for concerning restrictions on other rights and the test of institutions across the region um, to strike the appropriate balance. So trying to figure out um, so much with this pandemic really, I think in a few years time is going to be a very important point for the evolution of human rights understanding and democratic principles globally. And so one of the first challenges I think that emerges um, in the COVID context is the democratic challenges, um, which has seen a, whether you think ordinate or inordinate, um, trend um, a consolidation of power in executive authorities to respond to the crises, oftentimes invoking either emergency powers or emergency-esque powers. Um, since the, the, the early part of this year, oftentimes continuing, uh, and the need for states to calibrate how much is too much and how much is enough. And so in Jamaica, for example, um, our government has used the Disaster Risk Management Act. Um, and I say this without so much of a criticism, just as an observation that really was not ever intended to respond to pandemics um, in order to configure a suite of executive orders that do everything from configure business opening and closing times, um, school reopening, um, curfews, lockdowns, uh, mask wearing, um, geolocation tracking, controlled entry of persons, all through public statements. And so our Disaster Risk Management Act um, allows for the, the minister, in this case, in this case, the prime minister, um, to speak um, orders, which can be edited later, but at the moment of speech, they become enforceable. And so what we have effectively seen is 
perhaps reasonably and necessarily, uh, an emerging trend of rule by executive order, which is okay to respond to a crisis in the beginning, but groups such as Jamaicans for Justice and others have raised um, questions that you see globally about the role of parliaments um, in providing proper oversight and modality to the configuration of COVID restrictions and COVID responses, given that COVID is likely here for it to stay for a while. And so I give you a few examples. Um, when we had the, the controlled re-entry of persons into Jamaica, and we've seen this in other jurisdictions, the emergence um, of geolocation software to track persons um, was something that was, was taking place in Jamaica. There's an app uh, at one point, and you can check the record, this was, there was talk of importing um, tracking bands for persons who were high risk. Um, and we see it in other jurisdictions, mandatory um, installation of applications and phones um, for contact tracing and tracking. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a common um, uh, a trend that we've seen across the world of the leveraging of technology um, and even you know, automated processing for those who are into the data space and machine learning and AI um, to properly track people. And so JFJ raised um, the concern when we were going to have um, applications, tracking people, collecting their data, taking photos of their premises. Um, we were told that there would be voice recognition software and it would ping you if you left a certain location. Now, Jamaica had not established um, a, an operationalized a data protection framework. Um, and so this was coming in the context of an order, an order from the prime minister saying this is how it will work without any safeguards, policy pres prescriptions regarding the access to that data, that the, the erasure, um, how it harmonizes with other data sources, not knowing much about the source code of this application. You know, there's a risk inherent that human rights organizations have to always maintain healthy scrutiny around. Um, you know, and it was through outrage and through raising it that we'd got a second order saying, and here is how it will be operating. But we don't have actual regulatory provisions regarding this, um, and it, it's a concern similarly, um, the major debate that we had regarding the, the return of nationals and the right to enter one's country. These are human rights questions that societies have had to, including Jamaica, have had to grapple with um, in configuring the right response to COVID. And so the insight here that I would like to offer um, is twofold. Um, one, there is an in, a need for centering the role of parliament and legislative bodies um, where the effect of many of the orders and executive measures that are being implemented, either individually or cumulatively, have the effect and tone um, of substantial legal, of, of lawmaking, effectively, or of things that need the security of law and not the flippancy of orders that change with press conferences. Similarly, as other jurisdictions, in some respects, in a small degree, Trinidad, we see in the UK and other areas, have started to pass COVID-specific legislation that allow for particular flexibility for executive um, in, um, powers, but with certain protect democratic protections um, that are required, um, given the complexity um, in many jurisdictions of COVID orders that we have started to see ranging from how paid leave will work to insurance, to pensions, to even how companies can stage annual general meetings. These sort of more standing um, and complex and intricate questions of governance that are now occasioned um, by the COVID situation require um, corresponding stronger governance institutions and stronger governance approaches that don't make societies lose their um, fundamental democratic institutions. And, and trade them purely for the expediency um, of, of, of executive measures. And so democratic institutions here in the Caribbean and elsewhere need to reconcile the right approach. And I think we've had some time, you know, since about March, April, when these started to come out, come out um, to start to configure um, a more appropriate response. Um, so that's just one important insight. Um, the second is scrutiny is important, you know, if groups, people may think of it as small and minor, but if groups didn't raise up and say, whoa, are you just geo-tracking without a legal framework? What's happening with that data? We wouldn't have even gotten policy restrictions around the use of that data. And you see it in other jurisdictions as well. You started to see litigation in Trinidad regarding the, the, the criminalization of non-compliance 
with the ordinance um, for, for places of worship. We've seen them in South Africa, where the court ruled that um, their COVID restrictions were um, unconstitutional. Um, and it's not that COVID restrictions are in general unconstitutional, but probing and, and scrutinizing the specific objects of those um, with in, in, in accordance with human rights provisions of proportionality, sunset clauses, time ordering, um, um, rationality and the proximity to the object that it's seeking to achieve are things that need to happen. Um, and there's nothing wrong with civil society organizations subjecting um, COVID measures to scrutiny. Scrutiny is good. That's my second insight. And my final insight, and I know I'm almost out of time, is a caution regarding the securitization of the public health response. Um, it's a trend in the Caribbean and in the world um, to use security apparatuses to get what government wants to get done. And so people want, need to be in curfew, send police out there to arrest them if they're not in curfew. People need to wear masks, arrest them and lock them up if they're not wearing masks. Um, give police broad powers to do things. However, in contexts where security citizen relationships are strained and where security forces have a legacy of human rights violation, that presents a particular risk. I'll just give you two quick examples. Earlier in the COVID time, we received a complaint from a lawyer um, who said that police came to his law firm saying that when he was away, just his security was there late in the night saying they're here to, to they hear that there's an illegal gathering happening in his law firm and they, they want to search it. Um, and the law, you know, the security guard called his boss and said, boss, what should I do? The boss said, tell him not to come in. Um, there's nobody there that can observe that. Now, the real context is that they have been in a dispute with the police force for a long time and the police used, um, allegedly, he says, um, COVID as a way to come in. And the next thing it came that there was illegal gambling. That was the next reason. And next thing it was a vague reason. And then it, they, they, they tried to have forced entry and he's reported that he's seeking redress right now, I believe, through the courts. But that's a, an example where we saw as a report that we received as an organization, concerns about the expansion and enlargement of security powers um, because of the, 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 the general overtone of COVID. Similarly, um, we've actually received our first report now um, of an, of police involvement for mask wearing, but surprisingly, it is not in the general context of someone just saying they weren't wearing a mask. It's someone who is non-gender conforming um, and generally um, perceived and visible LGBT who was harassed by the police and then the reason given was non-mask wearing. And I say this to say that where opportunities exist um, for um, security forces to potentially utilize their um, power um, in, in unjust ways, those need to be um, curtailed um, through sensible configurations um, of COVID orders. So it shouldn't be a general lock people up if they're not complying or over criminalization. And as we saw particularly in Trinidad, criminal prescriptions um, were struck down due to several other procedural complications, but the general essence and we saw in South Africa. And so I think that is an important takeaway as well that we need to recognize that this is a public health response that security apparatuses can assist with. It isn't a securitization opportunity um, because there's actually a public health risk to locking people up where they can't distance and sanitize. And Jamaica has not seen a large amount of that, but we have gotten a number of concerning reports regarding it and the narrative that comply or be arrested is not oftentimes serving um, the larger human rights interest and can be a slippery slope if we don't watch it. And so with my precious eight minutes, those are my three insights. Thank you very much. Uh, I was just about to interrupt to say that you had oh, you. your eight <laughs> minutes, but um, you, know, you have given us um, you know, food for thought, but more importantly, you, you've brought to bear some of the nuts and bolts issues from a civil society uh, perspective for which we are very appreciative. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Lisa Inder, and I believe she has a presentation. Uh, Dr. Inder, the floor is yours. Dr. Inder. Okay, good afternoon. Sorry. Okay, I will just share my screen.
to it, know what's happening, but we let's see. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. I can. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, since we, uh, since this presentation, we agreed to do this presentation. I'm happy to say that I was promoted to the director of surveillance. Just to update you, Paul and colleagues. Okay, so let's move ahead. Um, I'm a cognizant of the time, so I look at the situation um, in terms of the measures that has been adopted by state and with a focus on health. Um, just to give a quick update, what we do at CAFL, um, we are leading that the, the health response section of our COVID-19 uh, in accordance with our mandate. And we are doing that through, you know, a series of um, multifaceted activities. Uh, we work at the highest level in terms of regional coordination where, you know, we work and provide documents on an ongoing basis to our heads of government. And we, we uh, provide technical support at these meetings, our health minister's meeting. We have something called a regional coordinating mechanism for health security, um, which we would have convened to really work with countries as well as agencies for a coordinated approach. Uh, we meet with our chief medical officers on a, you know, uh, very frequently, as well as, you know, we have daily WhatsApp group, we have an expert advisory group, and we're coordinating um, this whole response through our incident management team uh, for emergency response, which we would have activated on January 21st uh, for 24 hour response. So since then, we have been, you know, um, going on a 24 hour response for COVID. Um, in terms, we work with our different sectors, you know, that is listed there. Um, a key role of CARFA is to really update in terms of epidemiological surveillance. So we produce a lot of situation reports. Uh, last week, not last week, this, this Monday gone, we had our 100th situation report and infographics. We had a regional reference lab. So we do testing and surveillance. We verify PCR panels. Uh, we do a lot of technical guidelines. So we have uh, over 48 technical guidelines so far starting from how you would respond and test and so on. And now that countries are reopening, we have moved into reopening guidelines. Um, and together to, with together with those reopening guidelines, we have started a COVID-19 health rounds that speaks about capacity building, you know, for, um, for different sectors, not just our tourism, our NCDs and so on. Uh, because we are so tourism dependent as the first speaker spoke, um, you know, uh, and we have, it's, it's very important, the, the impact this have had on tourism, but the fact is that, you know, COVID is spread by travel is a, a major factor. So we would have formed a COVID-19 tourism task force um, with CTO, the Caribbean Hotel Association, the tourism, um, as well as the tourism association of a global tourism resilience center. And we work towards producing proactive health measures we have since moved ahead to um, if countries are doing the proactive health measures as well as uh, any particular establishment, we give them a traveler's health assurance stamp for health to safe for tourism. And um, it's also put on our Caribbean Traveler's Health app. So travelers coming to the region will see you know, and feel more secured. We do a lot of risk communication, risk mo resource mobilization, uh, and we work, you know, we have been selling supplies, lab supplies, PPEs, and now we are working with PAHO with respect to uh, getting vaccines for the country. Um, so those of you who like, you know, you can go onto our website. There's a lot of these big regional pro protocols. We were instrumental in developing the travel bubble. Uh, we have the common health and border policy protocol. Uh, repatriation, have you seen that citizens are repatriating? health sector response, those are some of the things. What we are seeing from our side um, in terms of update, um, well, you know, worldwide there are over uh, 38 million cases and we have passed over a million deaths. Um, for the CARICOM of our region, our first case was seen on March 10th. And as, as of October 12th on our last report, there, um, 
243,600 confirmed cases in our country, um, our Caribbean region. So therefore the risk continues to be very high. Um, we are working uh, with all our member states to promote a harmonized approach for entry country entry requirement, which includes testing um, that should include a PCR testing uh, as well as, you know, proper health measures. And of course, public health measures of mask and social distancing and hand hygiene. So this just speaks about the number globally. So sorry, I went, I pressed the wrong button. Okay, in terms of how what we test, we have tested over 25,000 samples. Of course, uh, countries also test as well, but the rates we are seeing um, in terms of the amount of positivity is 12.8, um, which is pretty high as well for um, the region. When we look at our rates of infection compared to other countries, the Caribbean has a rate of infection of 534 cases per 100,000. Um, if you compare that to the US, you know, it's relatively low, but it's actually higher than that what is happening in Canada. So, um, you know, even though we are small, we still have a significant, some high rates of infection. So let me go focus now on you know the area that I was asked to speak about. Um, we do know that mortality uh, due to NCDs in America, you know that that is huge. That um, it is a major entity is a major, the major contributor contributor to uh, mortality and as well as morbidity in the region. Um, Caribbean countries do account for the highest rates of NCDs. Um, but we are seeing an epidemiological shift, meaning that NCDs have surpassed communicable disease to become the leading cause of mortality. And in particular for the Caribbean, um, one in every eight deaths are really related to NCDs. So that's quite high. And this figure shows you, you know, um, the types of deaths caused by NCDs. So the biggest being cardiovascular diseases followed by cancers, uh, chronic respiratory disease, diabetes, and other entities. And we all know the way to actually address entities is through lifestyle behavior, you know, through, um, you know, exercising and eating right and reduction in, in smoking and drinking and so on. So this really is a big, um, well, this, this data really tells us, you know, we need to bump and ramp up on this. And as how it relates to COVID, we know that underlying factors like NCDs, you know, persons with NCDs um, are, are increased and it has been proven, proven that they are at increased risk to COVID-19 illness. Uh, this is a data for blood sugar and blood pressure in selected CAFA member countries. And you see again um, from different countries, but it is quite high. Um, high prevalence of raised blood pressure, as well as raised, raised blood sugar in Caribbean countries. Um, and of course, another alarming data is that, you know, we have uh, very high rates of overweight and obesity in adults in our member states. Um, and obesity is worsening. Um, and this is perhaps related to our low levels of physical activity and of course, increased consumption of energy rich, um, energy dense sugary food. And more data that really shows that, you know, um, we are of, of course smoking too much compared to other parts of the world. So how do we protect our persons with entity during the COVID-19 pandemic? Persons with NCDs are at high risk. Let's just note that, you know, sometimes we, we probably don't realize that, but it is a, a, anybody with NCDs is at a higher risk for severe illness and death. Um, so more than likely, you know, someone who do, without an NCD would probably be a mild case, but a person with NCD would, would be um, more likely to have um, a more 
severe illness. Uh, CAFA then would have done a series of different things and the ways to combat this. We have uh, produced a range of different documents protecting persons living with NCDs as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there are technical guidelines as, a, as well as range of infographics. Um, we keep focusing and we keep promoting, you know, the COVID-19 measures of washing your hands and wearing face masks, keeping six feet apart, not three feet, not one meter, but two meters apart, covering your nose, stay at home if you're ill, um, you know, keeping frequently cleaning and disinfecting your high touch areas and so on. Of course, and in particular for our entities, uh, persons with entities, to practice healthy lifestyle behaviors, healthy eating, physical activities, and stock up um, more than one month supply of medication if possible, and keep routine medical appointments and use of phones or tele health net consultation where possible. Um, for older, older adults during the COVID-19 pandemic, that is 60 and over, these people too are at high risk and as such, these older adults must be protected from the effects of COVID-19. So again, we do, have, we do have technical guidelines on that, as well as infographics. The same measures of mask and hand hygiene and keeping apart and cleaning and so on. But in addition for older, older population, we want them to avoid mass um, crowding and gathering. Do not allow our visit, uh, visitors, if they are ill or have been in contact with someone, with COVID-19 in the last 14 days. Um, use reliable sources of information for healthcare like CARP and PAUS data, and you know, try to be as active, practice healthy lifestyle behaviors, eating and physical activities and so on. And ask older, older adults to identify someone who will make uh, healthcare decisions for you if you're unable to do so. So we have a lot of also different advice on our website, you know, making sure you are taking care of, seek medical attention, keep an eye on symptoms. When that surgical mask is so important, I know it could be a bigger headache, but we know the, we know the disease, you know, transfers through respiratory droplets. And we know these droplets can go very far just by speaking. So for older folks or persons with entities, we want them to wear masks like everybody else, but it's so much more important so that because they are at increased risk. Um, so wearing the mask and staying at home, avoiding crowds and so on are, are very, very important for protecting um, the subset of people. So with that, I don't know if I've passed my 10 minutes, but I want to thank you for your time um, and for listening. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Inder. Uh, not only were you within the um, time frame, but you have provided some very useful information for, as we say in the Caribbean, for the John public in the Caribbean on what CAFA is doing and on the situation vis-a-vis -vis human rights. I also like to take this opportunity to congratulate you on your recent promotion. I'm sure Thank it's you. very well deserved. Thank now we sh I shall pass the floor to uh, Miss Elizabeth Riley whose agency, Sindema, is always in the news, especially at this time of the year. Um, Ms. Um, Riley, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting Sindema to share some perspectives on human rights issues within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the presentation, I'm gonna to touch on three things to speak very briefly to the agency and its role, to give a bit of a context with respect to COVID-19 as we enter the pandemic in March, and also to then treat the specific observations and considerations with respect to human rights, but from the lens of the disaster manager. So we are an arm of CARICOM, and we have a remit to treat things disaster management we have a big geographical remit, as you can see from the country shaded in yellow on the right-hand side of the diagram. And the critical message there is one of diversity. We have diverse countries, diverse hazards, but in this context, also diverse experiences with the COVID pandemic. And the specific remit of the agency as per the mandate 
is articulated in the boxes on the left, and this will be available after the presentation, so I won't go through those. So with respect to the context, COVID-19 struck the Caribbean and entered what was already a very complex multi-hazard environment. In fact, coming out of 2019, the majority of the CARICOM states were already experiencing drought, and I'll pick up on that point a little bit later. We, in March, experienced our first cases of COVID-19. And then, of course, in June, we entered what was projected to be and has proven to be a very active hurricane season. And in addition to that, all the other hazards that can potentially impact the region are still there, and some, in fact, have been affecting even during COVID. Now, what we also saw is that there was very varied levels of planning for a pandemic ahead of COVID impact in the region. And this has implications from the lens of the human rights discussion, because it means that really the playbook was wide open in terms of how we address the pandemic. So even though countries had influenza plans, the specific treatment of pandemic was not necessarily fully articulated but it means that there's then a space and opportunity, which I'll speak to later as well. Dr. Inda already mentioned public health led, all of society response, which means that we could utilize our national level coordination mechanisms to engage key actors who need to be at the table, including those who deal with human rights issues. We know the situation with our states has been very dynamic and continues to be dynamic, I would dare say with varying hot spots across the region as we look over time. There's also a varied perception of risk, and I think that has human rights implications as well, particularly at the individual level and with respect to responses that individuals have um, to actions to be taken, et cetera. And the last message here is, of course, that important need for flexibility in how we are progressing as disaster management, human rights, health practitioners through the pandemic. I wanted to mention very briefly our resilience framework, which was articulated in response to a critical question asked by our heads of government in the aftermath of Irma and Maria, what does resilience look like in the context of CARICOM states? And we worked with our partners to treat with uh, a framework um, speaking, building on five pillars, sorry, social protection for the marginal and most vulnerable, which is very important from a human rights context, looking at the issues of economic opportunities and livelihoods, safeguarding infrastructure, protecting our environment, and of course, operational readiness and recovery. And the connecting threads around the diagram are also important for consideration. So let's zero in specifically then on some of the considerations that we saw in the context of national disaster management organizations. And for the first three areas, I tried to pull some subcategories from Resolution 1 2020, which dealt with pandemic and human rights in the Americas. So with respect to the category of economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights, I want to treat with two things. Um, one related the whole issue of access, particularly to basic requirements such as water and food. And with respect to water, I mentioned at the start that we were coming out of a drought and some countries were still in, within drought. And what it meant is that there was a requirement for um, significantly increased um, re amounts of water um, to treat with and to stay consistent with the health protocols which were being recommended at a time when there was a drought, therefore water shortages already. And what we saw happening from the government and utility perspective is that certain actions were taken to ensure that persons had access across the region. These included reconnection of persons who had defaulted on payments, um, and who were previously disconnected. There was also moratoriums put on, in place on, on payments. And it was really measures that were designed to support the marginal and the most vulnerable. But in a discussion I had with water utilities just this morning, one of the things they indicated is that they also saw persons who had the capacity to pay not paying. 
So this, of course, uh, renders the water authorities in a bit of a challenging situation because they, at the end of the pandemic situation, as we move out of it, eventually we will, will still need to be viable institutions to produce water, et cetera. So getting um, their fees is, is very important. Um, on the matters of the access to food, um, the National Emergency Management Organizations also came into play to address this from a human rights perspective. And we saw that national relief uh, mechanisms were brought into play in a number of territories, um, particularly during lockdowns. We saw governments utilizing these mechanisms to facilitate distribution to vulnerable persons. But in one state in, uh, that I know of in particular, one of our states, distribution actually was undertaken to the majority of the population. So that was a very interesting um, interpretation of governments play, government play, playing its role in supporting the population to ensure they have nutritious foods. Um, the matter of states of emergency restrictions on fundamental freedoms and rule of law um, our observations at Sedima were similar to the two speakers ago, the gentleman um, who was on the panel, um, because we also noted that different legislative vehicles were utilized to give effect to the requirements for the physical distancing. And in many cases, states of the emergency legislation were um, invoked and specific um, orders were put in place to uh, support that and directives. We saw in two states, I, um, our, our presenter mentioned Jamaica, but there was another state I, we know of that invoked their Emergency Management Act and articulated specific, specific directives to facilitate um, those measures. And then of course you mentioned also the specific legislation. So I think one of the things that um, really could be interrogated further is really the, the rationale in the thinking of governments. And of course, the points that were raised about then what were the human, right, in, re, human rights implications of those decisions. Um, we also saw digital surveillance being used in states. And in fact, um, more states are getting into the conversation around digital surveillance. Um, some of them are actively utilizing it. And in fact, um, I, I saw a demonstration just a couple of days ago um, of how one country is utilizing it where persons are actually tracked um, utilizing GPS units and it's monitored on a 24 hour basis at a incident command station in, in one of the states. So this, this whole issue of human rights with respect to privacy, I agree with you, um, has, has come into play. On the issue of vulnerable groups and children, um, we did see some incorporation of consideration of vulnerable groups into some of the measures um, particularly rotational arrangements for access to shopping, et cetera, where persons with disabilities, elderly persons were given um, particular consideration. And on the children's side, I want to mention this because um, child protection is an important cross-cutting theme of the work that we do in collaboration with UNICEF. And they put out a report um, in April, I believe, which looked at the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 on children and young people. And there were, of course, interesting observations there with respect to implications for children and access to education, also statistics on increases in domestic violence, evidence of increases in ch of child abuse within the lockdown situations, et cetera. So I think there's quite a bit to be investigated there. And lastly, on governance arrangements, I do believe that the national level Emergency Operations Center, the coordination mechanism, is one which provides a, a very useful space for how we integrate um, human rights considerations in making sure that the key actors are at the table. At the regional level, I want to mention uh, one, one particular matter because the whole issue of access to critical medical devices and supplies became a real issue for the region with the distortion of the global supply chain. And uh, certainly we are all aware of the actions of some of our more powerful uh, neighbors. And this provided some significant challenges for our states being able to access 
uh, these critical PPEs, et cetera, were required. And therefore, Sedima worked with CARFA and our other partners to facilitate um, um, support heads of governments and their efforts for access. And we worked on the distribution com component through the integrated regional logistics mechanism. And this is just some of the work that we would have done to deliver um, PPE to um, CARICOM member states um, during the event. So just some final thoughts. Um, I think we do need to have greater documentation of the experience with respect to human rights and what is transpiring and continues to transpire with the COVID-19. I do agree with uh, uh, the previous speaker on the issue of the undocumented migrants. I think this is a specific issue that we do have to examine more closely. It's important that we assess the human rights impact of COVID-19 and look at it over the continuum of this event, because it's not like a hurricane or an earthquake where we have a one-off impact, it finishes, and then we move into recovery. What we're seeing is that COVID is going to be with us for a prolonged period of time. And this is something that we do have to give specific attention to. The need for research to make sure that we have an, a strong evidence base for our actions and finally, I think we ought to see the COVID event as an opportunity for us to further integrate human rights issues into the work we do in building resilience across our states. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Elizabeth Riley, for that very um, uh, overarching and very um, informative um, presentation. I particularly like the fact that you touched on economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. And um, many persons may not know this uh, in the Caribbean, but we do have a special rapporteurship on those, uh, those sorts of rights. So I, I appreciate you in making specific mention of uh, those particular rights in the context of the pandemic. And uh, hopefully um, in the question and answer session, uh, persons might want to refer to that. Uh, the final speaker from the CARICOM Institution is Ms. Nadine Bushell from uh, Impacts. Uh, Ms. Bushell, you have the floor. Ms. Bushell, we've seen the um, presentation. I'm here. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Colleagues, chair, fellow panelists, audience, CARICOM Impacts is happy to be here this afternoon to share with you some of the work that we have done with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Article 3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says everyone has the right to life and security of persons. And in this vein, CARICOM Impacts has the responsibility for overseeing the security architecture of the Caribbean region, as indicated in the Intergovernmental Agreement that established the security framework. One of the tools that CARICOM Impacts uses to manage and monitor the security of the region is the CARICOM Crime and Security Strategy. And basically what this strategy does is that it identifies those threats to the security of the region and they rank those threats. Now, tier one threats are those threats that are immediate and significant and have high impact and high probability of occurring. Tier two also have high impact and high probability. However, they are not as severe as the tier one threats. Then we have tier three, tier three threats, which are significant, high impact, but low probability. And we have the fourth tier of threats, which are future risks, which we don't know. They are unlikely to occur, and we don't know what the consequences are. And I just want us to note that in 2013, the issue of pandemics was deemed as a tier four threat of future risk. We did a reassessment of the threats in 2018, 
And it's useful to note that there were a lot of movements of some of the areas. And of note, pandemics moved from tier four to tier three. However, I believe if we could do that assessment now, in 2020, it will go to tier one, along with things like illicit firearms, gangs, cyber crimes, and other types of transnational organized crime. And the COVID pandemic, as we know, when it came to the Caribbean, and the governments were forced to implement a number of security, a number of responses to the pandemic. As you know, all governments insisted on social distancing. There were restrictions on movements. There were border closures across the entire Caribbean and the rest of the world. There was a suspension of what was deemed as non-essential services. And within this framework, the law enforcement and security officials, they had a very crucial and critical role to play in controlling the spread of the virus. But at the same time, all those security threats that existed, like the illicit um, trafficking and so, those things still emerged, those things still existed, so that the law enforcement officers still had to manage those existing threats in the environment. And just some of the specific things that our law enforcement officers had to deal with in the pandemic to support the governments in um, suppressing the effect of the pandemic, law enforcement and security officials in particular had to maintain public order, including managing gatherings of people. They had to support the conduct of contact tracing. They had to respond in some instances to jailbreaks or population unrest and riots. They had to effect effective border control in some countries. They had to secure the hospitals, which are the most critical infrastructure. They also sup supported the provision of transportation, of relief and other critical supplies. They also assisted in many countries in the transport of COVID-19 patients. And as I said before, in light of all of this, they still had to detect, assess, and respond to criminal threats that were in the society. So some of the key challenges that law enforcement and security officials would have experienced, I just focused on two, the police system and the prison system. And some of the challenges were for the police, long protracted and arduous working hours, concerns about their own personal safety and that of their families, how best to optimize the human resources that they have and the material resources, because they have to do a lot more with less resources as well. And they also have to satisfy varying demands on the security service because of the number of different stakeholders that they've been servicing now. And also they had challenges because this COVID-19 was new in assessing and adapting to the environmental changes that existed. In the prison system in particular, the issue of physical space for inmates, and that resulted in a restriction of visits to physical visits to inmates and virtual visits commenced. However, the virtual visits, there were some challenges with it because of bandwidth issues, because a lot of the bandwidth was being used for virtual courts. So some key considerations that the COVID pandemic has highlighted and some opportunities for law enforcement. The key ones are the police need now has to rethink how they police the community, how they maintain the security in their jurisdictions, while at the same time ensuring the safety of their own law enforcement officials so that they don't get infected. It called for more innovative approaches to fighting crime and securing the safety of officers. It also called for looking at new policing practices and also the advent of the, the use of technology-based solutions to automate um, a number of the things that police and law enforcement does, case management, fleet management, records management, criminal records management, and trading and development. And of course, in communicating to the public and increased use of digitization and digital tools. And some strategic considerations that we have to take into consideration in our response is the multidimensional nature of security. COVID-19 is a pandemic, however, it affected food security, it affected social as the social aspect of life, it affected the economy. 
And at the same time, again, we have to remember that we had to maintain a safe and secure environment for the Caribbean citizenship, the Caribbean citizen. So that is still a requirement despite what is going on. Of course, the priority of the security officers, their safety, we had to ensure that they had adequate PPE, that we avoided the risk of severe personal shortages within that sector. And very importantly, just I skipped a bit, national capacity, a number of the member states handled their issues themselves. However, there was still a need for some regional coordination and to ensure that there are minimum standards of addressing the pandemic across the region and adherence to protocols. Just to go in very quickly to some of the things that impacts did to support the COVID-19 pandemic. From January of this year, once the pandemic, once the COVID-19 was made known to everyone, impacts started to do contact tracing of persons from countries of interest that traveled. Um, subsequent to that, using our convening power, we had meetings of our immigration chiefs to discuss and our controllers to discuss some best practices with respect to COVID-19 prevention mechanisms and control, control measures for borders. Once it was declared a pandemic, we also had special emphasis on our prison service, where again, we advise on best practices in relation to um, control measures in the prisons. We also brought all our stakeholders together, the heads of all those committees, that is immigration, customs, police, military, prisons, and financial intelligence, again, to discuss control measures and to identify what some of the problems or gaps might that may have existed in the system. We also supported CAFA in drafting the common COVID-19 public policy for consideration of the heads of government. We also did training for our law enforcement officials, at least 500 of them, on the proper use of PPE. We also had a big project where we provided COVID-19 supplies to the regional prisons, to all the national prison services, I should say. And we also were part of the discussion, or any discussion, on the protocols for opening borders. Just to give you a little more detail on our prison project, we gave supplies to 13 member states, and you see the list of items there, like face masks, um, surgical masks, hand sanitizers, um, in Guyana, particularly, we did um, cardiac monitors, defibrillators to assist with the response to the pandemic. Critical in this response is the security cluster. We have colleagues from CAFA and Sedima here. And there are five agencies that make up this cluster, Sedima, CAFA, Impacts, of course, the coordinator, the regional security system, RSS, and CASOS, that is the aviation and security, aviation safety and security oversight um, system. The cluster is very important in that one impacts as the coordinator um, ensured that the pandemic, by linking all these agencies together, was treated as a health security issue. Impacts also used its convening power to do three things. One, it was able to sensitize member states on the issues surrounding the pandemic. It also allowed us to do some advanced planning among the cluster, as well as among CARICOM member states to ensure some coordination and minimum standards are met. And it also helped us to determine what challenges member states were facing and what support they needed. And very importantly, we provided the support and the coordination to member states directly and also to other persons in the clusters. For instance, um, other, other clusters like the food, the, food and food, the food security cluster, we provided su support to them. And lastly, we had a virtual security conference, which while it was an academic exercise, it brought together security experts, government officials, private sector, civil society. And what it did, it gave a very holistic analysis and discussion of the whole COVID pandemic, because we looked at issues like peace and security, police in the time of pandemic, COVID-19 and the future of borders, crisis and gender-based violence, climate change and security, maritime security, and the blue economy and prisons. 
And this conference basically tied a lot of the issues together. So we saw the fundamental impact that most of these things have on security, which is, as you know, is a basic human right of everyone. So this brings me to the end of the presentation. I want to thank you for the opportunity to allow impacts to share, and I look forward to any questions in the open session. I think I was within my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bushell. You were absolutely within your time, and your presentation uh, is one that I think we all look forward to because there's such a close access between security and human rights. It is now my great pleasure to um, introduce and to have um, some words from Professor Rosemary Antoine. I know time is, we run out of time, but Professor, the floor is yours. Yes, you are very generous with time. So hopefully I'll be, you'll be generous with me. Thank you so much for being here, inviting me. I want to focus on economic and social rights yes. as part of the wider landscape of the COVID-19 threats, really to our concept of democracy. Uh, particularly how it has exposed bear, I think, the deep structural inequities that exist in the Commonwealth Caribbean in terms of the access to rights, uh, right to education, to health, to water, yes, and to work. And Paul, yes, I was part of that formation when we started off that unit, and I'm glad it's a rapporteurship now. I think the human rights framework must address or be able to address these structural inequities, as opposed to merely focusing on overt forms of discrimination, which is what we tended to do. <clears throat> and of course, these issues intersect with civil and political rights. And just to give one example, in terms of health, um, we have evaluate that in terms of who gets scarce, adequate medical treatment, the ventilators, and so on. There are other layered questions and context, such as in the prisons, and I think you would have mentioned the prisons. How those prisons, including our migrant population in Trinidad and Tobago, who are detained unlawfully, how they are treated, that brings into relationship with the right to health and the right to life because of what we're dealing with, um, as elsewhere, there are clear patterns of disproportionality <clears throat> on these issues. So who ends up in the prison, who gets the bail, who can afford the bail, who's arrested and sentenced, who's on remand even. And here as elsewhere, it's a poor and marginalized. And when your society is stratified along race, we can begin to see all of these intersections, is poverty, um, economic, social, and cultural rights. It's a very interesting phenomena that really COVID highlights. And I also want to underscore sort of the procedural issues, due process, and the umbrella right of equality, which in the American human rights system, system sees as an umbrella right, that is equality and non-discrimination, going through all of these. So not only the right, I mean, must have equality and so an access to rights, for the law to have legitimacy, core element in the rule of law, and it's centered, I think, deeply on issues of development. So the pandemic, brings a greater obligation to these policy decisions and judicial decisions to be anchored in due process and equality as part of the whole developmental thrust. In pandemics and indeed in natural disasters, and others mentioned natural disasters, we really have to go beyond, look beyond the surface to identify those disproportionate impacts that quite clearly <clears throat> exist in this unequal situations, the real situations of, of people's lives in, in, in the Caribbean. And of course, here we're talking about poor and how that translates into rule of law or doesn't translate as the sustainable goals, development goals tell, tells us. Poverty, I think, in the Caribbean is very often invisibilized, sometimes even denied in the region, particularly when we're talking about education. We have this idea everybody has free education, and so on. Um, I remember when it started, we had these long lines lining up outside of a Catholic NGO in Trinidad, Living Waters, to give people basic food hampers. And instead of empathy, there was denial. And the minister said, oh, they can't be Trinidadians. It has to be migrants who lining up, although there was evidence to the contrary. So we're kind of blind to some of these issues of poverty. And COVID brought them to the fore. And so we have to ensure that uh, in terms of our rural communities, the urban low uh, income areas that we call ghettos, particularly right to education, that has been a really important one that came out in COVID. We are accustomed to talking about the schools being under-resourced, 
in these areas. We probably even desensitized to them. And I think also that I've also said in the past that there are issues of race there also if your population is sort of structured geographically alongside of race, which in some countries we have. But I think it's now clear that our education systems continue to exist against a very privileged backdrop. So the rich children and the rich schools, they continue to be advantaged. It's no longer so much about the physical resources in the schools and so in terms of the building, but now it's substituted by this phenomenon of students having to operate within an on online environment. So some of them who don't have the laptops or the access to internet, and I have to say, even at university, we saw this. And even when we were able to provide laptops, some persons in some places didn't have access to internet, either because they couldn't afford it or because their areas don't have it, because we don't have even development in the country. Not to mention migrant children, as Rhoda said, they don't even have access to education, but it's made worse by the pandemic. You can't even pay for it. Now your parents who are in the informal sector are displaced, very precarious working situations. I know the UNICEF, UNICEF did in fact have a, um, a, a report, did a report on that, children and COVID, which is very important. So no right to education and more displacement. So has the world changed? Is it a kinder, gentler CARICOM? I don't think so. We went ahead with the CSC exams, with the CAPE exams in July, without any thought or much thought about the thousands of disadvantaged children who had no laptop, no instruction, and no help at home to meet the challenge. It's middle classes and so who can afford to have their children because now parents have become teachers. And we are going ahead with it like that. In some places, they don't even have electricity, I saw recently on the television. So uneven national development, these structural issues, we must be able to, 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 to translate that into our rights lexicon, into our courts, and deconstruct what human rights really mean to confront these subjects of gender, race, class, and so on. Um, I don't have time to talk about the Equal Opportunity Act, but we have a mechanism in there which has never been used. In terms of the right to health, um, I also want to suggest that we haven't seen what we saw in the US in relation to you know, clear parallels with race. But we saw it with the HIV pandemic in terms of poverty and race. It's still the, the lower poor classes that have to use public transport and so on. We've been spared so far, but, I, but similar patterns exist. And in terms of the prisons, again, it wasn't just poor conditions or poor protocols, but access to water. The riots were, were caused because prisoners claimed, and it, it was verified, they didn't even have proper water in the prisons. And we already have... Uh, an outbreak. Can you imagine you're on your man for one cannabis or one marijuana slip, slip and you end up dead because of COVID? I mean, that is quite uh, terrible, including the many migrants we have in Trinidad who are actually imprisoned when they shouldn't even be detained. So all kinds of these issues. We are seeing high incidences of sexual violence as well. Um, I'm also president of FBAT, Family Planning Association. So we have the task to treat for them with a UNHCR. We are seeing high levels of women and girls very much more vulnerable in this time of, of COVID. Uh, many migrants, of course, are forced into sex work. So not just the question of income, but also the question that become stereotyped as highly sexualized women. They are easy prey. Violence is on the, on the increase in relation to Venezuelan migrants, girls, and women. And I want to agree with what has been said about the states of emergency. Just to say that even their due process, um, equality and non-discrimination, how we police in terms of a, of, a, of a crisis is important. We've had several examples in my country where children from the ghetto and people from the ghetto and poor income were reprimanded harshly or even arrested for breaking the COVID rule. And they sort of the high flyers were not. And that has caused a lot of comment, um, just as what happens in the prisons where it's a police. And finally, I want to touch on labor law, um, just to say the right to work. It's quite clear now that there needs to be a balance, but the whole structure of labor law needs to now be reconfigured. We've had a lot of pressure placed on it because of the pressure labor environment. The whole concept of protection of, of termination of employment and job security, all of these are severely compromised. 
who should fit the bill when workers are not able to report the work. We, nobody has any idea. All of the carefully constructed protections um, have, have sort of gone through the window in, in the pandemic and they need to be reformulated within a human rights um, construct, trying to get labor equilibrium and so on. Also being able to have social service uh, systems which go beyond formal forms of work, but also informal forms of work, including domestic workers who are not even covered in our labor law. So all these issues of force majeure, it's very frustration of the contract. What we have seen is that a simply a legalistic framework cannot work if we are interested in human rights. It's an entirely new paradigm. And so the bailouts and so on must give us better sustainable solutions. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Professor um, Antoine. Uh, in fact, your, your presentation seems to, or seems to have responded to one of the questions that I was going to put um, to the group. Um, and it's a question um, which has been raised in the Q&A. And I will still mention it. It says, are governments in the region engaging with the issues on healthcare and social security from a human rights perspective? especially for migrants and refugees. And I think that, in fact, you did mention uh, a, a bit of it in, in your presentation. So I don't know if you wish to add anything further uh, in respect of that specific question. In terms of migrants? Yes, it's there, especially for migrants and refugees. Well, right. So I actually probably spoke for less than my eight minutes. I was so conscious. But um, the fact is that, you know, we have, I just finished a report on that for PAD, PADF on Venezuelan migrants in particular. And uh, they have no rights in Trinidad and Tobago, mainly because the country, as men, some others, refuse to accept international law obligations. So the first important thing for this is that one, there's an amnesty, a so-called amnesty, which we don't know whether it will be um, um, expanded. But under that, it is specifically all migrants and even refugees who are supposed to have all rights cannot work, sorry, can work, but their children can't go to school or have any of those services. Supposedly, they can go to the hospitals, but for barely emergency services, not for surgery or anything more um, sophisticated. And many hospitals actually turn them away in, in reality. Um, but, but generally, my, because that's just a temporary arrangement, generally, many of them, and it just started back again because they escaped COVID for COVID, then it went on the uptake. They are being detained, they are being deported, sometimes they're not, they are being detained in very unsafe conditions, and the Sh Shagaramas base and the police barracks and so on, with no protections against COVID. Even the Coast Guards are complaining because they, their lives are also threatened. So it's a complete mess. And no, they really have very few, if any, rights at all. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I, 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 although time is of the essence and we've actually run out of time, I still want to give one or two questions to the um, uh, panelists uh, to address. Another question that has come up is, what impact has the imposition of the state of emergency curfews have had on human rights in in the particular country or in the Caribbean region? Uh, and I'm wondering, perhaps this is a question that could be answered uh, by either you, Professor, or perhaps um, Commissioner Macaulay, or, or, or by um, uh, Dr. Rhoda Reddock. Um, we didn't have a state emergency in Trinidad and Tobago at all, but we did have very harsh protections, and I think other speakers did mention. And my point was that it's not equally um, policed, let's put it that way. That was my main point. But I know St. Lucia and others and Jamaica had, so maybe they won't talk about a state of emergency. In fact, um, I, I, I do recall that in one Caribbean country, when the government went to parliament, it sought to have a, a state of emergency for a whole year. And it was, some people think they are unconstitutional, a lot of these yeah. states are emergencies. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, the other question, and this is a question I believe de definitely for um, the Dr. Radak, is um, how has the lockdown affected women and children in the region? Right, thank you very much, because I didn't get much chance to explore this. I think they were affected in so many ways. I think the first point that everyone, in a way, all the activists were expecting was the increase in gender-based violence against women and girls who were locked down in homes with their 
uh, with their uh, perpetrators. And in fact, this has been a global phenomenon. It is something that has happened all over the world. And this was another eye opener, not eye opener, but a reminder to us that the uh, patriarchy is alive and well and just waiting for the opportunity to assert itself. So that uh, I think in, in many countries, certainly in our country, the Coalition Against Domestic Violence did put on a serious response. And in fact, in Trinidad and Tobago, there were many donors, private individuals, as well as companies that did uh, try to support. But one of the factors was that the shelters were overcrowded. And I know there were circumstances where women could not get access to shelters. Uh, the problem of work, unemployment, as I mentioned, all low wage workers, all the so-called self-employed uh, women, all of them, I think within a matter of weeks, they were thrown on the breadline. Their families were in a situation, I think this must have been a regional factor. So I think the precarity of everyday life was what stood out for us. And of course, women were affected in very different ways uh, and very specific ways because so many of them have responsibility for children and households. But I'll stop there. There were others in my paper which I could mention elsewhere. Thank you very much. Um, another question that I would like to put in this, perhaps the one that um, uh, I don't know if Malcolm is still on or with us, but he, he raised the issue of the you know security forces um, and human rights. And I wonder if um, uh, our folks friends from uh, Impact, um, uh, Ms. Bushell, can um, speak to that issue of the security forces uh, actually, in some instances, using the pandemic um, in his, in, I think he almost said to settle scores, uh, as it were, rather than to actually do what they were supposed to do with respect to, you know, policing the, the um, restrictions in a very fair and objective manner. So I do not know if um, either Mr. Malcolm or uh, Ms. Busher would like to take a stab at that question. Uh, sure. Oh, go ahead. Uh, you go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. Great. Um, yes. And so it's, you know, it's, it's largely what you see um, for the security forces, which who, who, in general, um, you know, exhibit at times, and it's a small number, not all security forces, who would exhibit in general times rogue behavior, uh, behavior that is not in keeping with professional standards. Um, in, in those contexts in general, um, where various opportunities present themselves, the same persons are existing in those circumstances. And so we, I think more of what some of the COVID restrictions provided um, are as largely greater opportunities for those particular few but influential bad actors um, to find another way to, to operationalize um, those same motives. And so what I think the insight here that is important is the degree to which existing mechanisms within security forces um, for oversight and regulation um, are operating optimally um, and are uh, and are capable of preventing that type of either mission creep or abuse of authority, but also the degree to which the language of leaders and policy makers enables and supports that type of activity. And so, you know, the, the common narrative is that, well, Prime Minister say, I, I can, I'm just giving an example. Um, them say, if, you, if, you, if you're out of this, I can lock you up and it's, it's sort of, it's sort of edging on and, and using fuel, um, if you will, um, dep depending on the language um, of policymakers and of, and of leaders. And so what I think is key here is that we recognize that the human rights issues with policing in general that the region faces don't go away because of a crisis. And if prior to COVID, this region was very seized 
by the need to address its cross-regional policing issue. We had regional conferences on use of force standards. There have been millions of development dollars focused chiefly on improving um, human rights um, um, of, of security forces and other stuff. Those issues have not gone away because a crisis has, has hit the region. Um, what it has created um, is a potential opportunity to inflame it, um, but also a opportunity for us to realize this issue and create and take corrective measures. And so I think thinking about it as a general issue that has now manifested in specific ways um, allows us to help tailor appropriate responses to it, including configuring in um, whether it is executive um, responses or security policy that um, seeks to act on the important work that needs to be done by, by, by police force uh, well, by, by police forces to recognize this issue and provide directives to law enforcement professionals surrounding it that may look like force orders in particular um, police forces in Jamaica it's called force orders that clarify um, um, when detention should be um, used um, and seeks to steer people away from an overuse of detention. Um, it looks like staff orders or force orders um, or, or, or edicts and, and, and policies related to public interaction as it relates to COVID and providing clearer guidance on if and when um, detention should be used um, in relation to non-compliance or perceived non-compliance with COVID. To, to end this point really briefly, when we had a, a localized lockdown of one area in Jamaica, um, St. Catherine and largely in the Portmore area, one of the complaints we got from one of the storekeepers was that um, they, their previous basically beef with the police was being used um, when it was time to have the store locked down to basically prey on them, that they lived very close to their home and they had stopped visitors coming into their store, but they couldn't do their work and close down the store and be off the streets at a certain time. But they weren't breaking, they weren't breaking the curfew, they just lived close to home. And the police were insisting that they themselves had to vacate their store, even though the store was not open to open the business earlier to the curfew time, um, basically what they said by virtue of a beef. And so the bottom line here is whether this is proven factually in the end result is that people are complaining about uneven and inconsistent approaches to policing occasioned by the COVID opportunity. And it's an opportunity for security forces to be responsive to that in clarifying guidance um, to officials and to, and to officers relating to the human rights standard of detention, for example, as a last resort and de-escalation of any type of um, more coercive measures as a last resort as well. And we can learn from jurisdictions, even in other places that, that use ticketing systems first and only when there is non-compliance is deprivation of liberty. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. I'm afraid I have to rush you because we run out of time. Um, Nadine, would you like to comment on that issue, please? Okay, just to add a few points to what um, Mr. Malcolm just said. Now, in terms of security forces, particularly police and prison officers and probably some of our border officials who have to interact directly with the public. Uh, one of the things you have to understand that this situation of the pandemic is something that is new and there would not have been necessarily policies or in place that would have helped the police officers to understand how to treat with these specific things that have arisen because of the pandemic. So what I would say is important now, one, coming out of the pandemic, the whole idea of lessons learned and highlighting like for the senior officials in these um, positions, in these um, agencies, the law enforcement agencies, to see some of the issues that they have identified and have occurred over the period to assist in developing proper policies and program, programs. And very importantly too, I think, is the whole issue of training and capacity development. And we have to understand that a lot of these police officers may have issues, may, may not have had things like bias training and so to assist them in addressing these types of situations. And we also have to recognize that this situation is also a high stress situation. And some of them are under pressure. And uh, some of them also, even among the police forces, there is not uni unanim unanimity in how they perceive situations and how they should react to it. 
So these are things that we have to consider. I think now is an opportunity, as we said, for them to look at more different ways of policing, more digitalized, more digitization, looking at the use of force policy. We want to avoid things like overcrowded in prison facilities or police cells. How do you address those things while at the same time maintaining law and order, but also being equitable and fair in your treatment? So I think the two things would be training and capacity development. That's one. And also proper research and lessons learned coming out of this situation to assist agencies like parks to design appropriate one training programs and policies for the officers. Thank you. Thank you. So the key here is training and research uh, going forward will be key to you know uh, uh, making the um, security services much more adaptable, much more humane, much more. Um, uh, objective in um, applying the regulations going forward. I want to uh, make a, a comment which I believe brings in what um, Dr. Inder and Elizabeth Riley have presented and that is you know a lot of suggestions have been made about governments um, uh, employing more training and safeguarding of human rights during states of emergencies. And I think this is an area where, um, you know, approaches sh should be made by the regions to the various institutions to assist in that area. And I don't know if um, uh, Dr. Inder and uh, Ms. Elizabeth Riley have any concluding um, remarks to speak about that issue of, um, you know, human rights during states of emergencies. Well, I can probably go first if Dr. Indar doesn't mind. Um, so from the Sedima perspective, I think the COVID-19 is really an opportunity for learning as Nadine has indicated. And as I mentioned in my presentation, in many instances, there was no playbook and the playbook has evolved as we have moved through the pandemic. And I think that we have had sufficient experiences now between March and now we're into October. And based on the indications from our health colleagues, we will be living with COVID for some time to come. So I do think that this is the opportunity for taking corrective actions um, based on what we, we've observed so far in the pandemic. And I also think that those lessons are transferable to other post-hazard impact situations. Um, as I keep reminding us, we live in a multi-hazard region. And in as much as we have COVID and COVID is ongoing, we do have to keep other hazards in the forefront because they can impact and impact at the same time as COVID. So the types of human rights issues that we're discussing can potentially be compounded because we're dealing with multiple hazards at one point in time. So I, I wanted to share that. And thanks again for the opportunity to contribute. I've really enjoyed being on the panel and I've learned a lot also from my fellow panelists. Thank you very much. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, those are very um, you know, uh, you know, thoughtful remarks uh, that you've given. And um, you know, Dr. Inder, any uh, final thoughts from you? Have we lost Dr. Inder? Uh, I'm speaking without Maya. Okay. <laughs> yes, so nothing much more in terms of human rights per se during, a, during like when we have pandemics and so on. But as part of this whole regional security cluster, Sedema and in parks and Kafa, you know, the first thing um, we aim to do is to protect um, everyone that, that, that we deal with. So for instance, if we deploy we protect, um, you know, all the persons who are deployed and we ensure that whatever mission they are in whatever country, whether it be during a hurricane or disaster, I mean, uh, Ms. Riley can speak a bit about that, but even through COVID that, you know, they are well protected, um, you know. So for instance, during COVID right now, a lot, we, we, we spend a lot of time in terms of protecting, you know, um, anybody who is out there, 
whether it be on the RSS plane, you know, what are the requirements or what, what they should be doing internally here and so on. So from that point of view, we are, pretty, we are looking at human rights first in terms of their right to protection, their right to safety. Yes. Thank you very much. And um, the final word goes to Commissioner Margaret McCauley in the form of a wrap up of the session. Um, thank you very much. This has been an amazing uh, event that we've had, and we really have to do more with the Caribbean board. Anyway, there's, um, if I can just refer to something that um, Dr. Roder Roder, uh, Roder mentioned or asked for. She said she's asked for a human rights culture human rights should be better known and the Caribbean, uh, even within Caribbean states who have ratified various instruments, um, do not know. So we need a human rights culture. Now I just wanted to say that the obligation uh, to have citizens know what are the rights involved in instruments ratified by a state it lies with the state, as we know, rather, because they leave it to <laughs> NGOs to do for them. But it's their obligation. So I think what we should do is deepen the knowledge of our legislators, the people, the politicians who go into houses and they make up the people who sign these international instruments to understand the full state obligations. Because I'm sure if you ask lots of our parliamentarians, they don't know that. So we have that to do, NGOs. <laughs> we have more work uh, to do. And then um, um, I must inform you all, and I'm very happy to say so, the Caribbean is an area of priority for the commission. It is, a, we're focused on that. And, and so that means there will be more technical support from us, more interest, more, more, more name it, and we will be with that. And in the, because of that too, I want to ask you, because we collect information from uh, uh, um, um, reliable sources, cogent information, and, and views which we uh, um, informs our our work and, and what we do in particular areas and for our reports and so on. So we would be very grateful if you can let us have copies of all of your presentations um, um, in, in that regard. Then remember that the Inter-American Commission is the OASS, the Organization of American States, um, primary organ for the promotion protection and protection of human rights in the region. And it stresses and makes it quite clear that within states, states must uh, engage and have participation from all civil society, NGOs, private sectors, a uh, um, um, representative of various groups of persons, the diversity of various groups of persons within the state, especially when considering policy making, legislation, and so on. And it is particularly important during crisis periods, because at the end of the day, um, I think the real test of whether a state in relation to human rights protection status uh, um, it measures up to something, some good level, is in how they uphold the human rights of the most vulnerable during crisis. And I am afraid, I, th I, I think we all fail. In the region, I don't know any which has done that. And so we have to, to this is it, bring the human rights culture into the region much more effectively. And we have the opportunity now 
um, to deal with challenges uh, in this regard and in others, um, which have emerged and which are still emerging. And the thing is that we have to identify them and make them known and try to get our state actors to act on them in the proper manner. Uh, um, through, of course, training. And we are also have the basic, basic uh, uh, knowledge that we learn from experience. And we have been experiencing this as well. I just want to remind everyone too that when states embark on making policy statements, orders, decrees, laws, and so on, which intent is to restrict the rights of their people and guarantees which people have, they must act in principles of proportionality and they must be temporary. And they should strive for the strict compliance with public health objectives, comprehensive protection in relation to all the rights of their people. I thank you all. I think I think this was an amazing session. And I thank all for his hosting of it so well. And it's good to see friends of all, Rosemary and Roger and and Roger, who I could I didn't recognize when I saw his face on the screen. That's a new style you have, young man. <laughs> and it's nice to meet the new friends, Elizabeth, Nadine, and um, Lisa, is it Lisa? Yes. Yes. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Paul, Wendy, and uh, all the other secretariat members who assisted us. And thanks to the um, rapporteur, um, interpreters who have assisted those who do not speak English. And a great deal of thanks to the greater public who joined us in this event. Thank you again. God bless you all. Keep you safe. Take your precautions as we all should. Thank you. Bye bye. Well, it's after those, uh, what, you know, words of summation, uh, some of which quite sobering. It is only left for me to thank all the panelists, the audience that have joined us during this webinar, and of course, my colleagues in the executive secretariat that have worked assiduously in putting this webinar together. Thank you all and have a very good evening and we hope to see you again sometime soon. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye.